Hello and welcome to the Stoics. This is our final class, uh, class 11. And the, the theme is Logos and Ethos. But in practice, we're looking mainly at one thinker, uh, one neurologist and psychotherapist, and then another philosopher. On the left, Viktor Frankl. And the text under discussion today is Man's Search for Meaning. But towards the end, we're going to look also um, at the work of Foucault as well and the care of the self. This will also give us an opportunity to bring in Martha Nussbaum, but more importantly, round up some of the many threads of this course. So I've been your guide <laughs> for these um, the last 11 weeks. Um, and what we'll do towards the end of this recording and then when we meet on Monday is we'll begin to think about the processes of, of stoic thinking, the ones that I've kind of sketched out at different points already. And I've kind of tweaked them a little bit and it'll be interesting to see where we get to with this. Okay, so our agenda is as follows. Um, as usual, we're going to begin with a bit of a historical context. We're going to meet Viktor Frankl and his world. We're then going to move on to survival, what survival means. The so man's search for meaning um, It's written in two parts. And the first part details Frankl's own survival um, of the Holocaust, of various concentration camps. What does survival mean? And how does that then tie into the argument that Frankl wants to present about our need for meaning, our will to meaning, our will for meaning? And what kind of meaning or meanings does he derive? We'll then get to something which brings us closer to the, to the title of today, which is ethos and ethics. How do we derive an ethics out of what Frankl called logotherapy, kind of therapy for meaning? What would that involve? This then allows us to get to Foucault, and we're going to look at some interesting references uh, to the term ascesis, a key term of the Greek Stoics in Foucault's later work. We'll also have Martha Nussbaum here as well. And then in our final part, some, and some kind of roundup remarks. I won't ramble on too much. Um, you've had me ramble on for the last two months. Okay, um, so let's begin. Right, let's meet Viktor Frankl. Here he is. So I'll be interested when we meet uh, to find out what you know about Frankl already. And if you've read any of his work before or are familiar with it, I think some of you already are. Um, his best known work is, is Man's Search for Meaning. Now, what to say about Frankl? Well, he's um, a psychiatrist and founder of Logotherapy. He's born in Vienna in 1905 to a Jewish middle-class family. What's interesting about Frank is that he's very precocious, um, and we'll talk about this more in a moment. He has, makes connections with Sigmund Freud and then Adler later on. But then he kind of separates from these uh, leading scions uh, in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy through this emphasis on our need for meaning, which actually appears in his work, appears in his reasoning, even before the outbreak of the Second World War. He is a, a clinical psychiatrist, a neurologist um, in Vienna uh, up until World War II. Well, he, he still works up until really 1942. Uh, he treats thousands of people a year, specializes in depression and suicide. And then fatefully, he, um, he's offered a visa to leave Vienna, but he decides to stay. And some months later, he is arrested alongside his wife and his parents. And they're transported. Well, at first they're transported to the Theresien uh, uh, ghetto, and then later on he's transported to Auschwitz. I'll talk first of all about his earlier life, um, pre-World War II, just so we can kind of get a sense of who this man was. He kind of presents in Man's Search for Meaning like the experience of being in the camps provided him with deep evidence for the need for meaning that he then presents in the second part of this book. But there are directions in his, in his thought, in his clinical practice that are worth knowing beforehand. So this um, image here, is from a youth clinic that Frankl uh, set up for young students who are suicidal. On the right, we see Viktor Frankl with one of his hobbies, which is mountain climbing, also a hobby of Friedrich Nietzsche. 
So as mentioned, uh, Frankel was born in 1905. Um, his father is a civil servant. He's one of three children. He, a family of a middle class. He is very, he seems to be very uh, intellectually gifted, very precocious from a young age, from his teenage years. He attends usual high school classes, but then in the evenings he attends adult ed, adult education psychology classes. So this is from the ages of like 15 and then 16. He is not just studying psychology, but he begins to correspond with Sigmund Freud. And Freud helps him publish an article in the International Journal, Journal of Psychoanalysis. At this point in time, Frankel is age 16. You know, this is the kind of journal that, you know, um, that clinical doctors and psychoanalysts would be publishing in. He's also very interested in philosophy um, at a young age too. Just as he's learning psychology in adult education, he's also learning philosophy too. And his philosophy teacher encourages Frankel to give a lecture to the adult class. And there's an interesting quotation from this, which in a way indicates uh, Frankel's kind of disposition, his ethos for, philo for his work later on. Frankel says, it is we ourselves who must answer the questions that life asks of us. And to these questions, we can respond only by being responsible for our existence. You'll notice there the, uh, the emphasis on responsibility and our need to take responsibility for our own freedom in this lies the ethos that we'll try and sketch out later on. So Frankel has this kind of relationship with Freud, an intellectual friendship. Um, and then later on, when he becomes he, more distant from Freud's ideas, you'll see this kind of at play in the text. Um, and then he becomes closer to another psychoanalyst, um, Alfred Adler. Uh, and then later on, he kind of falls out of Adler too. And he's becoming distant and falling out with these other leading uh, theorists and practitioners of psychotherapy because of this emphasis early on on our need for meaning. And I think this is just important to keep in mind. Here is Frankel as a young doctor. So from late high school years, um, he he's very interested in... Um, psychiatry and very interested and, and studies medicine at the University of Vienna in order to um, train as a psychiatrist. He specializes early on in depression and suicide. Now in that slide just earlier there was the uh, image of this kind of message about the youth counseling program and this is something that uh, Frankl sets up while he's studying at university. It's uh, Vienna's first private youth counseling program and he works with troubled youth in different ways. He kind of he, he begins in response to the high suicide rate among university students, which is partially linked at the time uh, to the onset of exams and things like this. What you might want to keep in mind, though, is years. Remember, Frank was born in 1905. So what would he have seen in his first 15 years? Well, Austria is one of the Axis powers, one of the losers of the First World War, although in reality, every side lost the First World War. Um, it's just some sides lost worse than others. Frankel um, and many others of his generation lost fathers, lost brothers, lost relations, and experienced, you know, an economic shocks, loss of prestige, all kinds of things. Frankel's family also went uh, reportedly hungry during the First World War. Uh, there's a really, uh, if you uh, Google Victor Frankel, there's a website for him about his work and about logotherapy and it's a great bio there apparently he um, they would have to go they, they would have to kind of ask for food from nearby farms so he's doing this youth work he's studying medicine um now from the age of 25 he begins his clinical practice he's working um at this place at the bottom this is the Maria uh, Theresen Schlossel, um, it's a neurological hospital in Vienna. And then from 1934 to 37, he's at the place just above the Steinhof Psychiatric Hospital uh, in Vienna again. Now it's at the latter place that um, Frank was caring in particular for suicidal patients. And what's staggering, if we might want to compare him to our understanding of private psychoanalysis, uh, is that he's treating thousands upon thousands of patients every year. 
I think he mentions in Man's Search for Meaning about uh, treating 12,000 people. It's about 3,000 patients a year. And I suppose that's, an that's a different kind of relation uh, to the med medical understanding, response and treatment of suicide than to what we might see in psychoanalysis or based on our discussions last week, the discussions of suicide in Camus. Now, just as Frankl grows up with one war, enough one arrives. Uh, the Nazis annex, they um, seize, they take Austria, not really much fight, many are pleased, in 1937. And so Frankl, as a young Jewish man, young Jewish doctor, finds it increasingly difficult to work. He's kind of forced to leave his position at the Steinhoff Hospital. And then in 1939, uh, he becomes the head of the Department of Neurology at the Rothschild Hospital, again in Vienna. And it's the only Jewish hospital in Vienna. It's the only place they can get work. And now one of the things that Frankl does whilst he's at this hospital is he helps um, some patients, mental patients, escape euthanasia. These are Victor Frankl's uh, parents who he talks about. In fact, he says something quite moving um, early on um, in Man's Search for Meaning. And it refers to him, Frankl, being uh, given a visa to travel to the United States in 1942. And Frankl kind of sets out, he says, why didn't he leave Austria? You know, he had a get out card. And so he was unsure. And so he talks about his experience. He was unsure about leaving his parents behind. He also had a brother and sister there. And so um, as he's kind of deliberating about this, and he talks about this in the book, um, he sees that his father, the guy on the left, has got um, a piece of marble, I can imagine marble with kind of fire scorch marks on it, on the table. His father says that he found it um, in the burnt ruin of a synagogue in Vienna. There were 90, about 93 synagogues in Vienna um, that had been destroyed by the Nazis. Now, it doesn't seem that Frankl could read Hebrew, but his father can. And so Frankl asks his father, what does the one Hebrew character on this bit of marble say? What does it represent? His father tells him that it represents one of the Ten Commandments. And this one in particular is to honour one's father and mother. And so Frankl takes this um, as a sign from heaven that he should stay to protect his parents, which is what he does. I don't know the, the exact date that he's given um, a visa, but it's in September 1942 um, that um, he and his young pregnant wife Tilly on the left here uh, and his parents and his brother um, are, are all arrested and transported. They go first to the uh, Theresen Ghetto and then uh, Frankl is trans, uh, transported to Auschwitz. From there, he's transported to two further camps, Kalfering and Turkheim. And Turkheim is the camp that appears in, in, later on in the first part of Man's Search of Meanings, which is where um, Frankl is caring for the patients with typhus and he ends up becoming very sick himself. This is part of the Dachau complex. Now, after the, the war ends, um, Frankl returns to Vienna in August 1945. And this is when he discovers that his pregnant wife had died along with his parents and along with his brother. He had one sister called Stella who manages to escape. What's interesting about Frankl is that he decides to stay in Vienna. Many Jewish people, those Jewish people that managed to survive um, often didn't go back, but Frankl did. This, this is something interesting about that that we'll get to. Here are some more images. This. Um, here is off the Leopolda Synagogue, a kind of wonderful grand synagogue in Vienna, close to where the Frankls lived, uh, that was destroyed um, in Kristallnacht, uh, the night of the broken glass. I mean, that might be where Frankl's father got the, um, the ruin from. And then you'll just see on this sign here, uh, Victor Frankl's middle name is actually Emil, but... Um, because of anti-Semitic Nazi laws, he was forced to have uh, the name Israel as a middle name. And he could no longer be called a doctor. Instead, his title was um, a fac behandler, like caretaker, I suppose. Um, 
of the juice. And this is from, um, this isn't from the Leopold um, Synagogue, this is from another in Vienna, you can see. We can kind of evoke this image. Um, so Frankl gets back to Vienna in 1945 and he tells us a little bit about what happens next in terms of the writing. In 1946, some months after liberation, uh, he decides that he's going to write, write his experiences and kind of reconstruct uh, the thesis of the book that he had been working on before he'd been arrested. Now he writes Man's Search for Meaning over nine days and originally his, his aim is, is for it to be anonymous. He mentions actually a bit about the text that he was working on um, before being arrested. Um, uh, it would have been called The Doctor and the Soul. And he has it in Auschwitz, and this is where he loses it. Well, it's, it's not. So this book itself is written very quickly. He then remarries in 1947, uh, and he stays in Vienna. He heads the neurology department of the Vienna Polyclinic Hospital for a further 25 years. He remains very interested in philosophy. He completes a PhD in philosophy in 1948. The title is The Unconscious God. The, this text, these writings are then revised and expanded and um, yeah, uh, in a, a book that comes up towards the end of Frankl's life, Frankl dies in 1997, the age of 92, um, a work called Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. Just keep this in mind that Frankl has this um, philosophical training and ability from, from an early stage too. And it's really from the late 1940s into the 1950s that um, Frankl's philosophical and clinical practice, which he calls logotherapy, um, becomes more and more influential. He ends up writing over 30 books, he lectures all over the world, receives honorary positions, um, meets the Pope, uh, and then this text too, his most famous one, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, sells millions and millions of copies. This cover says 9 million, I've seen 12 million, uh, translated into at least 24 languages. It has an, an earlier title, um, From Death Camp to Existentialism, which is interesting because um, whilst Frankl uses a term like existential vacuum in places and seems to be aware of existentialist philosophy, he also rejects it. We'll come to this later when we talk about Camus. Now, what does Frankl want to do with this book before we end this section? He tells us quite simply, maybe deceptively simply. I'd wanted simply to convey to the reader by way of a concrete example that life holds a potential meaning under any conditions, even the most miserable ones. I mean, this is the aim of the book. And this is one of, one of several things that we'll, we'll need to explore and discuss. I mean, it certainly does provide that, that life Life has meanings and being living in life, especially under immense pressure and amid immense suffering, there is a need for meaning. This meaning can be found in many different ways. And one of the, some of the most remarkable um, revelations I had when reading this book again uh, was the meaning afforded to suffering. I think this is quite profound. The book itself has been criticised a little bit, but not very much. And, I've, and the criticisms that you'll read online are a little bit overstated. Um, uh, Rollo May, um, a, an American existential psychotherapist, um, criticizes the book in one place. It's interesting. Maybe you, you might want to keep this in mind too. I don't really. I don't actually think this is a fair criticism. But in 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 you know in for the interest of balance, you 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 can have it here. You can be aware of it. He says. There seem to be clear solutions to all problems which belies the complexity of actual life. It seems that if the patient cannot find his goal, Frankl supplies him with one. This would seem to take over the patient's responsibility and diminish the patient as a person. Is there something authoritarian about what Frankl is doing? I don't really think that's remotely fair. But I think if Frankl sometimes can be a little bit prescriptive, um, and we get this in, in, 
areas of part two as well, we have to bear in mind his context, his training. He was experienced in treating and uh, rehabilitating and caring for thousands and thousands of patients over his life. And he seems deeply aware, on the one hand, um, of not just our human beings' need for meaning, but also our need to live, our, our need for a kind of healing when we've lost meaning. But he's also aware, and this makes him quite refreshing in my view, um, in his emphasis that each individual must discover their own meaning. And this will have something to kind of compare with Camus. Okay, right. So much for his context. Let's start getting closer into the book. Um, I'll just say in, in this next section, we are going to be talking um, about um, the about the concentration camps uh, and about the Holocaust. Um, and so this is going to this section is going to deal in more in more sensitive and traumatic matter. Um, so I guess just a warning, and then um, the, in the following section we focus more on the kind of the pure ideas of logotherapy. So you can skip to part three if 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 you need. Okay. Right, so in this section we're going to talk about survival and what survival involves, psychological survival. Here I want to give a little bit of background. I don't want us to just kind of drop straight into Frankel and, and lose track of everything else. I want us to think a little bit about the context of this book. So Man's Search for Meaning written in 1946, four years after Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus, which we talked about last week. Now, what, what had happened in this world? What things do we need to be aware of in terms of meanings lost and found? Well, I think this particular context is um, more, is most relevant to France, but it bears on other countries too. The experience of the rise of Nazism but then in France, at least, the problem of collaboration, the problem that um, within France, resistance to um, German military invasion was weak. And there were many who wished to collaborate, like Field Marshal Pétain, up there on the left, the older guy um, with the kind of white moustache. What did it mean that the Nazis were so easily able to take Paris? And what did fighting back mean? What did resistance mean? How could it be? that fascism, uh, what had seemingly been a kind of reactionary nationalist movement in Italy and then Germany, can end up taking over all of Europe with it kind of rancid sympathisers emerging in all quarters. What did it mean that um, an entire group of people could be identified, scapegoated and persecuted, often to the indifference or even um, assent of people around them. These all present very disquieting problems. And thinkers have different responses to them. Theodore Adorno, someone who makes it to the United States, unlike Frankel, um, sees not just in the rise of um, the Nazis, the, the, the program of the final solution, the death camps. He sees in this something not just that is um, indicative of the power of fascism, the power of Nazis, maybe the power of fear, but something that actually indicts the project of the European Enlightenment that had offered so much in the late 18th century. Here, think of Voltaire, think of Immanuel Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? The emancipation of human beings through reason, through the conquest of nature, through technology, through the new science, through scientific endeavour. That enlightenment promised a world of natural equality where the autonomy of the human mind could be truly cultivated, no longer fettered by religious superstition, um, aristocratic power or prejudice of any sort. Now Theodore Adorno, key figure at the Frankfurt School, works with another colleague there, Max Horkheimer, the director of the school, um, on a work called The Dialectic of the Enlightenment. 
book that I think is published in 1947, which is a year of the man's search for meaning. In this work, Adorno and Horkheimer see a logic of the Enlightenment playing out and realising its um, apogee um, in the final solution. In this use of technology, this kind of instrumentalised use of reason to conquer and stifle human freedom. In its search for identity and its eradication of contradiction, it ends up resulting in the destruction of, of minority groups, of any perceived opposition. Cordona says famously that the aims of the Enlightenment became stuck in the mud of Auschwitz. Elsewhere there is a line, um, the translation is sometimes disputed, that where Adorno says um, there is no, there could be no lyric poetry after Auschwitz. He says something slightly different. But the broader gist, I think we know where we're getting to. Now Camus we had last week, and we talked about the myth of Sisyphus. It's interesting to think about what what this text is trying to say. I think about the absurd. The absurd is a kind of inevitable condition that results not just from the universe itself, but it results from the human need for meaning. It's when we need and when we strive and when we search for meaning that we come into contact and we have a, an encounter with the indifferent, cold, silent universe. And it's this desolation, this loss of meaning, we looked at this with Kafka in, with Kafka in part, and that leads to the um, conclusion that only suicide or facile religious hope are the two responses facing us or to not think to carry on working and that's that now Camus deals a lot with this world's meaning and he's also dealing with the context of fascism with Camus too um, we also have the context of colonialism in his case Algeria he's French French white French Pierre Noir but what it meant to be poor in a colonised country. There's an interesting lecture that Camus gave in 1946, a lecture that he gives in, he's invited to give it in the United States, uh, and it's called The Human Crisis. I encourage you to look it up, I'll just give you some quotes from it, because it points to this something about the need for meaning and the loss of meaning, which I think is very important to keep as, our, as, a, as a historical context here. Now Camus is speaking a year after the liberation, this time of Paris, the end of the war. And he's talking about what next, what after. He says, quote, Today in France and in Europe there is a generation who thinks that anyone who places his hope in the human condition is mad, but that anyone who despairs of events is a coward. This generation does not believe the achievement of universal happiness and satisfaction is possible but it does believe in diminishing human sorrow. It is because the world in its essence unhappy, is unhappy that we need to create some joy. Because the world is unjust, we need to work towards justice. And because the world is absurd, we must provide it with all its meaning. Again, I think there's something very interesting here about this need to assign, this need to recognise and a need to provide meaning out of the ashes, out of the fragments, out of the ruins. I think there's a comparable historical project in what Frankel is trying to do. They just take place in different settings, in different arenas. But there's a different kind of approach to what we might associate with traditional Western philosophy, to the work of Aristotle or Descartes, do these philosophers, in a traditional sense, talk about our need for meaning? Or can we even kind of like ridicules Galileo and others? No one died of the ontological argument. This is a philosophy which is a, a kind of um, a higher science of the mind's understanding of nature. But it doesn't deal with man's relationship to nature. We don't really see this concern with the need for meaning in Spinoza. It just doesn't matter. 
nor in David Hume, nor in many other thinkers. We might say that we do see it in Socrates, and we do see it in Plato, and to an extent we do see it in Immanuel Kant. Socrates who says that the unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates, in a way, the kind of spiritual founder of the school of the Stoics. Now in this bit we're going to start looking at Frankel and the context of the camps. So I'm just, just telling you. Um, okay, so in the first part of Man's Search for Meaning, Frankel deals with um, his experience of the camps, his survival. An image here is um, of the rail, railway entrance into Auschwitz. Now let's think about what the first part of Man's Search for Meaning is trying to do. And what I'll just say here is that um, this uh, recording will make most sense if you've already tried to have a read of Man's Search for Meaning. If not, I'll explain to you the key parts, but you might want to have a go at reading it first. Now in the first part, Frankl set, sets out to convey not the facts of the concentration camps, not the key events. Rather, he's interested in their psychological effects and their internal effects. The question he asks is, how is everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? In practice, so the book, even though it kind of sets out to do this, it, it kind of moves away from the same quite quickly. Franklin instead kind of wants to explore how it was that he himself really is the main example, managed to establish a purpose for, for remaining alive, for staying alive. He tend, while he talks of um, inspiration from some other prisoners, and we'll mention that in a moment, he mainly focuses on his own experience, his own need to focus on the future amid immense misery and suffering. He has different terms for this focus. He talks of the hard fight for existence, and he says that it's this mental fight, this inner struggle, is more significant than just that of food. He says that this was an unrelenting struggle for daily bread and for life itself, for one's own sake or for that of a good friend. And that's interesting. There's a lot of emphasis in this work on friendship, on love. And we'll get to this. It's very important uh, in a moment. It's something that we might not necessarily expect to see. And it's something that Frankl does want to emphasize again and again. Concern for others, ethical concern for friends, for countrymen. This kind of way of, of staying alive through care and through compassion and what that means. Now, the controversial part of Frankl's text, in my view, is that it emphasises the power of positive thinking and outlook uh, to respond to, to remain unconquered by passing events, which is a key stoic principle. But it's controversial when we think about why people um, manage to survive the concentration camps. Clearly other factors really mattered, like physical health, like age, like the work position that one was assigned to. We might want to think here. A Primo Levi, if this is a man, Primo Levi, uh, an Italian Jewish man, young chemist, who also survives uh, the concentration camps. Now one of the things that uh, Primo Levi emphasises is, is that it was the fact that he was a chemist that enables him to survive because he's given a, a work detail, a work position where he's indoors. Frankel, with his medical background, ends up becoming a camp doctor and he's got some unusual privileges. Now, Frankel's going to emphasize the power of thinking, but we should keep in mind these circumstantial details as well. We might also want to keep in mind with Primo Levi uh, years of composition. Um, Levi works on if this is a man. Um, over 1946, the same time as Frankel, although of course they neither are aware of the author's work. Uh, and his book uh, is published in 1947. But if, if this is a man, and man's search for meaning, are then translated into English and published in 1959. In fact, if this is a man, it's an interesting text to keep in mind when we think about Frankel's account of the different psychological responses um, of the prisoners to living in the camps, how one goes from apathy to where. And this 
to wear would remain a problem for Levi Fry's life. As I mentioned, um, an unusual emphasis in Frankl is the concern with friendship and loved ones um, as part of, of one's survival. We even get this early on in the text when he talks about when the convoy is departing. He says how, quote, every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home and to save his friends. We also get, both in Frankl and in Levy, a discussion um, of the Muslim or Muslim manner would be the plural, um, which means Muslims, basically. Uh, in the, in if this is a man, it's just the German is kept, um, whereas um, an English translation is given in Frankl. Now, what is the condition of the Muslim, of the Muslim man? Now, this is a nickname from those in the camps. And it described prisoners who had given up, who were emaciated, starving, insensitive, unaware of what was happening. What we also get um, as a final brief comparison with uh, Primo Levi is this sentiment that the best didn't survive. We might want to think uh, of Levi's account of his friend Alberto. Here in Man's Search for Meaning, um, it's a broader point. Uh, Frankl doesn't really dwell that much on particular individuals that he knows or that he's friends with. But he mentions early on that in order to survive, there needed to be some kind of abandonment of scruples, and he doesn't really explore what he means. He says, We who have come back by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know the best of us did not return. And that opens an interesting question about the book about the purpose of the book. In Rabbi Harold Kushner's preface to this book, he puts this across very well. He says that the book is concerned less with the question of why most died than it is with the question of why anyone at all survived. I think that's a useful way to kind of think about the, the thesis, if we can call it that, of Frankl's text. Now this is um, a cover of the German edition psychology of the concentration camps. Now in this part I want to talk a bit about the phases of mental reaction which which kind of maps over the first part of this book um, and Frankl has most to say about one of them in particular. Now he begins by talking about the sense of shock, the disbelief um, of the prisoners when they arrived and here we might want to think to the shock of those who haven't immediately been put in the left line of, of passengers disembarking from the trains who would um, go straight to their deaths. And so this is a shock of those who realise that they are to survive, but to survive in what way and in what conditions. Different things come up in this state of shock. There is a mention of suicide, of feeling suicidal. There's also hope, the, um, the delusion of reprieve, that it would all end very quickly. Now this state of shock doesn't last and Fred has most to say about this second stage which he calls relative apathy and this is the kind of the, the Frank would describe it as an emotional death it's a state of psychological indifference to one's own suffering and that of others whereas in stage one um, the prisoner would turn their eyes away at terrible suffering or terrible punishments in stage two, there is no averting of the eyes, and Frankl really emphasises this not looking away. He describes it as a necessary mechanism of self-defence. It enables you to stay alive, this relative apathy. But in what kind of state? Now, it's interesting because Frankl describes, well, he seems to kind of flip between describing the prisoners as being in what he calls in one place a vegetable, like a vegetal state, of apathy, of, of non-feeling, of lack of meaning. And then enough parts about the profound spirituality and the interest in religion and politics of many prisoners. Clearly there are different responses to the apathy. And then there is, I suppose, a, a giving up after apathy. And this is the, st the state of giving up, he describes it, this is a, a becoming a muscle man. The third phase, he doesn't say that much about this, uh, is disillusionment. And this is after leaving the camps, after liberation. 
It's how you come to terms with what's happened. Anger, shock, but then also shock at the indifference of those who, those who were at home, those who knew what was going on but didn't really oppose it and then don't really recognise it afterwards. It's a very profound to say. But the book really has most to say about the second stage. Now, here I'm showing some art from the Polish painter uh, Jan Komsky, uh, a Polish resistance fighter uh, who ended up being in Auschwitz. And there are lots of images that he produces, and these are just some. Now, let's keep going with the state of relative apathy. We've talked about the emotional death. There's an interesting scene where Frankl is being transported um, to another camp and they pass his old home, his area in Vienna. Now he's in the middle of the carriage and he wants to get to the end just so he can look out the window. But he's denied the right to view his old home by the other um, prisoners on the carriage. For them, they don't see what the point is. Why is it worth seeing it anymore? He's already seen it. Franklin gives it as one of many different examples of where the prisoners have kind of lost something that might be distinctly human that sense of com compassion we could say not always but in some but it's not just a loss of humanity in the prisoners he also describes his own loss of humanity he describes himself as looking out on these familiar streets as if he were a dead man quote i had a distinct feeling that i saw the streets the squares and the houses of my childhood with the eyes of a dead man who'd come back from another world and was looking down on a ghostly city. And in many respects, we can understand this kind of perspective, this alienation. It makes it all the more remarkable that he does return to Vienna and he does work in the neurological hospital, in the, the polyclinic for such a long time. The book asks this question, why do, why do some survive? And one interesting uh, argument that it presents is that it's often the less physically robust who survive. Now, Frankl is interested in that. Why is that? And he says often they had a deep spiritual life, a deep inner life. They've had a sense of meaning, profound meaning, that could animate them and keep them moving and keep them focused, whereas those who were physically stronger eventually gave in. He talks about politics and religion. He says about his surprise at how at the depth and vigour of religious belief in the camp. Sensitive people were actually more able to survive, not less in these circumstances as he sees it. And this fits into his wider argument. Because they have this fortified inner self, this maybe you could even call it an inner citadel, as Marcus calls it. Frankl says, they were able to retreat from their terrible surroundings to a life of inner riches and spiritual freedom. Only in this way can one explain the apparent paradox that some prisoners of a less hardy makeup often seem to survive camp life better than those of a robust nature. Now this comes up very movingly in part one when he talks about love. And he talks about the thought of his wife, his wife Tilly, who had been pregnant with their first child. They, they marry in 1941. And he describes a scene where um, he's among a work detail, a group of men who are marching silently um, very early in the morning through, um, through the ice and through a piercing icy wind. The guards abused them, kicked them, hit them with the butts of their rifles. How is it that they go on? How is it that they endure amid such misery? And Franklin presents this in a very revelatory way. I'll just quote it in case you are not yet familiar with it because it's quite a wonderful and important moment. He begins by describing the conditions of this walk. He says, Hardly a word was spoken. The icy wind did not encourage talk. Hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, the man marching next to me whispered suddenly, If our wives could see us now, I do hope they are better off in their camps and don't know what is happening to us. And Freckle says it's when this man presents them the image of his wife, their wives watching them, that suddenly a completely new image floods his mind and comes into view. And it's 
holding, it's an attachment to this image, to this person that enables him to then endure the remaining minutes, hours, days, weeks, months. Frankl says, a thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Now, this is an, an important kind of first discovery um, in the book's ser search for an answer to the question of how does some psychologically survive? And it begins in love, and then it's sketched out later in terms of meaning. And it's even if we don't have, you know, for even if we're not religious, even if we haven't spent, you know, much of our time studying literature or philosophy or anything like this we can still have a very rich inner life through this kind of focus and contemplation of love frankl says in a position of utter desolation where man cannot express himself in positive action when his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way an honorable way in such a position man can through loving contemplation of the image he carries of his beloved achieve fulfillment And he describes enough places the mental conversation that he has with Tilly. It didn't matter that he didn't know whether she was alive or not. He wasn't in a position to communicate with her in any case. But what he had was the strength of his love, this image, his thoughts, this deep connection in his mind, in his imagination, in his heart. Frankl talks about other sources of revelation too. In one place, the power of just simply contemplating the beauty of the world, the, the beauty in one scene of the sun over the Bavarian woods. This is actually the Bavarian woods in this image, the glowing sky. In fact, we'll, we'll cause one prisoner saying to another, uh, quote, how beautiful the world could be. There are also moments where love and natural beauty coincide. In another scene, Frank was talking about him, his he conversing silently with his wife, and in a telling phrase, he says he was struggling to find the reason for my sufferings. And then he describes this uh, coincidence of two things. He sees that a light is lit in a distant farmhouse. He's looking out, it's the dawn in Bavaria, he's looking out on this landscape, he sees a light in a distant farmhouse. And it seems to illuminate this otherwise as grey morning. And this light kind of coincides with this reflection on love. He says, in a last violent protest against the hopelessness of imminent death, I sense my spirit piercing through the enveloping gloom. I felt it transcend that hopeless, meaningless world, and from somewhere I heard a victorious yes in answer to my question of the existence of an ultimate purpose. We don't know what that view was, and in some ways it doesn't really matter what that view was, because it was a moment that was internal, more than external. And it's this saying yes to life in spite of everything is the phrase that Frank comes back to. In... Amid suffering, here is the answer. Here is the meaning. It begins in love, but it doesn't end there. Okay, in this next part, we're going to get a bit further into what Frank has to say um, about meaning. And here we're going to we'll, we'll continue discussing bits of part one, but we'll, we'll also start talking about part two as well. Okay. So there's an interesting discussion of fate uh, in this book, and fate is interesting in terms of the study of the Stoics, the resignation to fate. We see this in the Greek Stoics, we see this in Zeno, we see this in what survives of Crispus, this acceptance that everything that happens in the universe is predetermined by prior causes. What human beings call freedom, our free will, to make one choice or another, is actually very limited and circumscribed by our passions. 
The goal then is to understand these passions and understand our relationship with nature. Which is all good and well, but how do we square this um, coming to peace with fate and a resistance to what fate can make us do? Sometimes it's a great problem with just going with the flow, because that's often to go with other people's flow and other people's direction for us. It's to remain passive, as Spinoza would say, and not active. Frankl says that in the camps, there was a common belief in fate, in resigning oneself to fate, in accepting fate, in submitting to fate. But a powerful moment comes when he decides that he's going to, in his words, put, take fate into his own hands. To not love fate, amor fati, this is what Nietzsche encouraged, uh, means also, I suppose, to not submit to fatalism. Think about the link there, maybe it's a bit tenuous. But it's important to think about what that means, to recognise fate, but to respond to it by acting on the knowledge of what is up to us, as Epictetus would say. Now, one thing that makes Viktor Frankl uh, very interesting to read is that he refuses to blame anyone. He sees horrible things in, in the guards, of course, and in the camp commander, in the cafes, and the other prisoners, but he also describes moments of, of rare generosity from a particular foreman, from a, a certain commander. He's not interested in attributing collective guilt to the Germans in the way that Karl Jaspers was. Of course, there's this, this stoic precept there, isn't there, about avoid not blaming others. He also says it interesting that suffering is relative, it's like a gas, and, you know, it can fill any space. One person's suffering can, can seem really great to them. Sometimes an important thing is to help them understand the context, help them understand if it's really a significant thing to be upset about. Marcus himself talks about the need for compassion and sympathy for someone who's really upset over something they've lost, like a child who's had their toy taken away. Now I mentioned about fatalism and Frankl's decision to take fate into his own hands. Now this moment comes when uh, another medical colleague, as he calls him, um, offers to smuggle uh, Frankel out of the, of the camp that they're in. And this is, a, you know, an obviously a very appealing opportunity. And Frankel decides in the end that he's, n he's not going to do it. And it's interesting, it has a kind of resonance with his decision not to abandon his parents. He has a particular countryman in the ward where he's treating patients who is very sick and likely to die. He wants to say goodbye to them, but then doesn't want to say that he's leaving, but he senses that the other person knows. Frankel then feels a kind of a sense of responsibility, that it would be wrong to leave when this man is sick, this person is sick. And that's when he takes fate into his own hands. When he refuses this opportunity in order to kind of do what he believes to be right, when he acts on compassion. Now, throughout this course, we've had Rodin's think, The Thinker appear in various weeks. And here, it's certainly the thinker in front of the gates of hell that is most apt. The ways in which Frankl talks about the, the need, the necessity to focus on finding an inner spaces of meaning, inner spaces of purpose and dignity amid a situation of great misery and suffering in which you have very little control. You have control over one thing. Now again, there's something that's happening that is reminiscent of Epictetus here. This concern with what is up to us. This understanding of what is not up to us. Now the emphasis of Frankl is that what is up to us is our spiritual needs and our spiritual nature. And this comes back to the challenging part of this book around positive thinking. In a few places, Frankl says that we have a choice. We have a choice to make. He talks about those he saw who were courageous, who were generous, who were compassionate. In a certain sense, they chose to be like that in those circumstances. That's because they ensured that they retained their spiritual freedom, their individuality and their dignity. And it's this which is we need to keep in mind when Frankl makes this emphasis on their dignity and suffering. What it also involves is a refusal of a reductive view of human nature, that we are simply uh, animal drives and impulses, um, that we are simply victims of circumstance or fate. Now when Frankl makes this next point, I'm going to quote it, I want you to keep in mind Freud. You might 
have in mind enough of thinkers too. He says, but what about human liberty? Is there no spiritual freedom in regard to behaviour and reaction to any given surroundings? Is that theory true, which would have us believe that man is no more than the product of many conditional and environmental factors, be they of a biological, psychological or sociological nature? Is man but an accidental product of these? And the emphasis, the answer of course is no. He says later, the experiences of camp life show that man does have a choice of action. And here is Epictetus. And here is Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche does appear in various places. And of course, there's something very interesting about the ways in which uh, Frankl quotes Nietzsche when he's addressing the men in his block um, in a speech that does, that's intended to give them hope um, during a night when they're, where they're all forced uh, not to eat um, out of punishment for another prisoner who's stolen some potatoes. In these situations, what really matters is this rigorous emphasis and attachment and preservation of this inner inner freedom, this freedom to remain dignified, this this ability to remain compassionate. He talks about remembering those who went through the huts comforting others, giving away their last pieces of bread. These are the figures that inspire Frankel. On one hand there is his wife, his love, but on the other it's these, we could almost call them in a stoic way, exemplars of moral conduct. Frankel says, they may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one attitude, one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. I think we can see something of Epictetus in this remark too. We might also want, might want to keep in mind the ways in which Epictetus has been inspiring to others, like the uh, American um, Marine pilot, I think it was, James Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Now the book also brings in Dostoevsky, who, is, um, who made a, a contribution to Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus as well. And here it is around dignity and suffering. He quotes Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky, there is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my suffering. And what Frankl is trying to sketch out in these courageous, altruistic prisoners is this kind of, is the response to relative apathy. To kind of carry one's suffering with dignity. To not surrender one's ethical concern for the other. To not surrender one's personality. Frankl talks about the doing of this as becoming animal. When we become animal, we become part of the mass. We're no longer human individuals. This is to lose our reason. And in that is to lose our meaning. I guess it's very different from the Dostoevsky that I wanted to bring in last week. Um, the parable of the Grand Inquisitor from the bro brothers Karamazov, in which the Grand Inquisitor, during the time of the Spanish Inquisition, who is um, planning, why well, he kind of, his aim is to interrogate Jesus Christ, who's kind of come back from the dead again, um, to say, well, we don't need, we don't need you anymore, because what the church does now, an authoritarian church, is it provides meanings. For, for people, so that they don't need to find them for themselves. In fact, Christ places a really difficult burden by necessitating that people find their meaning. I suppose this will be to read that passage in a, in a Frankel-like way. That this, me this need for meaning mustn't be surrendered. I mean, where there are opportunities for it in many places. Frankel talks about it in creative work or just in the contemplation of beauty in nature. 
But the big point of this part is this meaning in suffering and this courage before suffering. And what Frankel does, this is an image um, taken from an American photographer after the deliberation of one of the concentration camps. Um, Frankel gives other examples later on of, of other people that he's aware of. He talks about a young disabled boy who writes to him, um, the boy is, um, has got a terminal illness. And the boy just tells Frankel about being inspired to have courage before death after seeing this in a film. He also talks about a woman that he nurses in one of the camps who finds solace in the view of a chestnut tree from her bed. She feels a, a, a deep affinity with it and Frankel is really struck by this. And this is the thing that the, the book is trying to emphasize again and again. The need to find for that inner strength is found through the, the discovery and the attachment to things that are meaningful to us. Frankl says, quote, psychological observations of the prisoners have shown that only the men who allowed their inner hold on their moral and spiritual selves to subside eventually fell victim to the camp's degenerating influences. In reality, and this is more controversial, there was an opportunity and a challenge. One could make a victory of those experiences, turning life into an inner triumph, or one could ignore the challenge and simply vegetate, as did a majority of the prisoners. Now keep in mind what I said about Primo Levi earlier, the different responses. How many prisoners like Frankel found meaning and in what ways? I'll leave that thought there, but just as a kind of point of comparison, because I know many of you who I've taught before are familiar with Hannah Arendt, we could think about a different kind of need for meaning or meaninglessness. When Aaron is writing about the trial of Adolf Eichmann in the early 60s in Israel, she um, presents this phrase, now well known, the banality of evil. Now, in Eichmann's case, he was a bureaucrat uh, who oversaw, planned the logistics of the transportation of many, many, many uh, Jewish people to their deaths in the death camps. Eichmann always said that he was following orders, this is called the Nuremberg Defence, um, and that, you know, actually if someone else had been doing it, it would have been even worse. He doesn't seem to take responsibility, but it's more than that. He doesn't seem to be able to kind of think. He's, not, he's just simply unable to think or recognise the immense harm that he caused. This is the banality of evil. Aaron here is challenging a term, uh, radical evil, which comes from Immanuel Kant. Might associate this with a, a psychopathic serial serial killer. The banality of evil is that it can be done by people who are just completely unaware of the consequences of what they're doing. That their actions are meaningless. That they're never thought over or thought about. In fact, the the great horrors of something like the Final Solution could be. In could be kind of um, explained, I suppose in part by functionaries who were just utterly unaware of the, of the meaning of what they were doing. And therefore the need for meaning and the, the need to understand becomes of even more crucial ethical importance. Let's move into this part that follows quickly on. And actually this is the part where I'll, I'll say more about part two of man's search for meaning. Ethos, ethics. Here is Frankel after the war, and this is an image of the um, clinic that he worked over 25 years uh, after the liberation of the camps, after the Second World War. Now we've had, I've mentioned this uh, focus on the future, this need to have something else in mind in order to bear the worst sufferings. Spadez is mentioned briefly in this account. Frankl says that it is a peculiarity of man that he can only live by looking to the future, a subspecie aeternitatis, which means Spinoza from, uh, from the, uh, from the, as a species of eternity or from the perspective of eternity, I guess. Now, when Victor Frankl is thinking about his own focus on the future, uh, he imagines himself, you know, giving a lecture to a packed out room. 
and then later on when he's really sick with typhus um and where you can die at night because um that's part of the condition he keeps himself awake by trying to reconstruct the ideas of his uh, lost manuscript but there's something else that's very important here and this go takes us to the ethos part and this takes us to the logotherapy part which is a shift in perspective about the meaning of life we can call it a copernican shift you know the copernicus he's the guy uh who um who says actually the center of our galaxy is not the earth but the sun there's a shift in perspective the shift in perspective of the meaning of life is that the problem is that we often look to life to give us the meaning but instead we need to look at it completely the other way around life is expecting us something from us it's expecting us to find that meaning it's ex life is questioning us so that we give an answer for our meaning to our life we had to teach the despairing man that it did not really matter what we expected from life but rather what life expected from us we need to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead to think of ourselves as those we're being those who were being questioned by life. Now meaning, it's meanings, because these meanings can be different for each of us. There's nothing normative about this. There's also an emphasis on responsibility. We've had this too. Frankel calls on us to, when we think of the future, and when we deal with this question that life expects something of us, to keep in mind our responsibilities. These could be to other people, or they could be to projects. He gives the example of two people um, who were contemplating suicide. Both of them changed their minds. At the beginning, they're, they're struggling with, with this question. Why doesn't life have a meaning? There's nothing more to expect of life. But then Franklin says, well, well they, the, the question needed to be turned on its head. It wasn't about them expecting something of life. It's that life was still expecting something from them. One person has a child. The other person is a scientist, and Franco says in both cases they have important work, which means that they're not replaceable, and that's another thing that ties into ethical responsibility, that we are not replaceable, we are not disposable. We have a responsibility then to the future, to other people, to our own potential. We must wait and endure in order to realise that. Michael says, a man who becomes conscious of the responsibility he bears toward a human being who affectionately waits for him or to an unfinished work will never be able to throw away his life. And then this quote comes in, this is from Nietzsche. He knows the why for his existence and will be able to bear almost any how. This uh, is a, Fritz Frankl visits, gives a lecture to the prisoners at San Quentin in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about the theory of logotherapy, which is presented in part in part one, and then it's presented more concisely, and much more directly in part two. And in part two, Frankl is kind of like presenting the principles and the, the conclusions that one might draw from part one without necessarily needing to read all of it. And there are a few things that we can highlight. They kind of reflect things that I've already mentioned in this discussion. He says early on that logotherapy is focused on the future, on the meanings to be fulfilled by the patient in his future. He also talks about a will to meaning, and he's contrasting this uh, will to meaning um, against, say, Freud, Freud and libido, or Nietzsche, will to power. That there's something within each of us um, which is a primary motivational force. We might have to think with someone like, say, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, that um, self-fulfillment and meaning is a luxury. It's an armchair pursuit. It's something that we, um, you know, is, is only needed for some and maybe even be overrated. You know, this partly feeds into the bad reputation that philosophy and any kind of uh, speculative or critical thinking has in the English-speaking world. Um, Actually, and this is Frankl's point, the need for, for meaning, the need for one's life and one's actions to be meaningful is at the foundation of everything. And without that, life feels without purpose. It feels miserable. It feels bleak. We live in an existential vacuum. And he says that this is a condition particularly of the modern age. He's talking about the 1950s here. 
calls it a, a condition of nihilism, of belief in nothing. And this results in all sorts of pathologies, but more deeply, all forms of sadness, loneliness. Meaning then isn't a luxury, meaning is everything. Frankl says, quote, A man's concern, even his despair over the worthwhileness of life, is an existential distress, but by no means a mental disease. Logotherapy regards its assignment as that of assisting the patient to find meaning in his life. So this is something different from just understanding people as in terms of the satisfaction of animal drives, or even in a more, let's think in a more English context, of utilitarianism, of and the, Ber, Jeremy Bentham's uh, philosophic calculus, um, that, you know, we there's a certain kind of happiness that can be, you know, quantitatively measured, well-being. People say, no, we're more than drives, we're more than just bellies, we are minds and hearts. It may, our meanings may be found through love, it, they may be found through projects, they may be found through different forms of creativity or courage. Think of Camus here. They will differ for each one of us. But what logotherapy is striving to do, his clinical practice, but we could also see it as a philosophy, is this emphasis on us striving to find a meaning for us. Here's some image towards kind of getting on in years, this Institute of Logotherapy is founded in the States. This point about everyone having about everyone having a different meaning is brought up in part two in an interesting way of the analogy of playing a game of chess. And Frankl says, well, to ask, um, ask somebody what is the one meaning of life, what is the most important thing? Um, it's a bit like asking a chess champion, tell me, master, what is the best move in the world? And he says, well, that's, it's not a question that any chess grandmaster could ever answer because it all depends on the context and the situation. It depends on oneself. It depends also on one's opponent. It depends on one's circumstances. We might want to kind of keep this in mind, even when we think about the more prescriptive ideas of um, the good, the good life that we might that maybe we encountered in the Dhammapada. That rather than looking for an abstract meaning of life, we need to find specific meanings to us. He describes this in one place as, as vocation, a mission. A mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which demands fulfillment, he says. And again, this goes back to to this idea that life examines us and life interrogates us. Think of Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Frankl turns it on its head. The Now life is examining us, us. it's cross-examining us. And we need to answer for our own lives. Not just in the thoughts that we think or the values that we profess, but in the way we live. And ultimately logotherapy ties into an ethos, it's a way of life. Think of our Stoics too. That philosophy shouldn't be about the pursuit, the understanding of words, but it's the way we live. We saw this with Epictetus and with Seneca. He also says later on, it's a wonderful image, that freedom must always be accompanied by responsibility. That the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast needs a companion statue on the West Coast, the Statue of Responsibility. Which, and actually in San Diego, this is... Um, going to be built. I think they plan to complete it in a couple of years' time and it will look like this. Now, logotherapy in the final part is about responding actively to life's transience, and transience has been an important concept for us on this course. To recognize that life is transient, it's translated here as transitoriness, but to not respond pessimistically or gloomily, but in an active way. To respond to one's own sufferings in, in the forms of grief in an active way. That even when nothing really positive for oneself can be drawn, actually something positive can be drawn. One thing, and that's in, a, in our, our ability to, to having endured such realities, 
And this is presented towards the end of Man's Search for Meaning. And it's presented using an imagery of somebody who writes, who writes notes about the events of their life. This is very interesting. It'll become more significant in a second when we get to Foucault. Because Foucault will emphasise self-writing, writing about oneself, writing about one's life. Fackel says that a person who, quote, attacks the problems of life actively is like a man who removes each successive leaf from his calendar and files it neatly and carefully away with its predecessors, after first having jotted down a few diary notes on the back. He can reflect with pride and joy on all the richness set down in these notes, on all the life he has already lived to the fullest. And this is then contrasted with this thought of, shouldn't we envy the young? Shouldn't why the, the immense possibilities that a 16 or 70 year old has ahead of them? And Frankl says, no, we shouldn't envy the young in this respect because they have possibilities, but we've lived through realities. And these are sources of meaning. And meaning is the most valuable component, the search for meaning of human life. So in the final part, logotherapy takes us from logos, meaning, it could be also reason or speech, to ethos, to ethics. It's an ethics of responsibility, like this here, the statue, against a modern existential vacuum and lack of values. Frankl presents the, the categorical imperative, the imperative of logotherapy, um, in a way that involves a distinct, re a continuous examination and re-examination of one's life in order to live differently in the future. So it's kind of different really from eternal recurrence for Nietzsche. Michael says it is to live as if you were living already for the second time and as if you had acted the first time as wrongly as you are about to act now. Think about the emphasis there on control of our actions and our reactions on a kind of choice. A choice even when there are not many choices available to us. A choice when what is up to us is very limited, but on another level of the most importance. Our values, our inner life. There is no freedom without responsibility then. And this is the way that uh, Frank would dis distances himself from what unnamed existential philosophers we maybe want to keep in mind Camus or Sartre here Franco says <clears throat> what is demanded of man is not as some existential philosophers teach to endure the meaninglessness of life hey that's Camus and the absurd but rather to bear his incapacity to grasp its unconditional meaningfulness in rational terms <clears throat> And this is reminiscent of the discussion that we had uh, on Zoom uh, last week when we were talking about Camus. And this great question came up about how would Spinoza respond to Camus? And Spinoza wouldn't, wouldn't recognise the, the, the category of the absurd. What Camus calls the absurd is a failure in his own reasoning to recognise the non-human shaped um, structure of nature, of our natural existence. That there, are, there is meaning here, that reason can understand what is around us, that reason can establish human identity and human society and human values within nature. There can be natural values. It's just that they differ from the existing morality of the time, but that doesn't mean that we abandon them. There is no absurd. What the absurd, the absurd uh, for Spinoza is um, maybe it's a, it's a staging post. Um, a point that we then need to move beyond, which is for the striving to understand, the endeavour to understand. And this is something that we'll come back to. Okay, this is we're we're gonna we're on the final curve. So these next two parts are both quite brief. I wanted to kind of bring in Michel Foucault. I had a poll halfway through this course where I asked people what thinkers you would like to cover. Camus, most popular, not far behind. A double week on Foucault and Martha Nussbaum. So I started reading Foucault's later works. Um, his idea, his concept of the care of the self, 
something that becomes important to him in the final years of his life. He dies in 1984. It's from the early 1980s that we see this turn to the self. Now, when we talk about a turn to the self, this might imply something that is narcissistic, that is e egotistical. But that isn't really what Foucault means at all. It's an ethical concern with oneself, with caring and, and looking after and understanding oneself in a way that then attaches itself to an, an ethics um, that involves awareness, engagement and compassion for others. When Foucault is doing this work on the care of the self, his kind of the, what changes is, is the spread of Christianity where moral self-examination becomes much more judgmental and harsh. And so he sees in earlier writers, and he, he focuses actually on Seneca, but also Marcus Aurelius. Um, Plutarch is an offer. He says it's not just to know oneself, the, um, the imperative of the Oracle of Delphi, but to care for oneself. It's some interesting writes where this comes up, the technologies of the self, is a seminar that he gives at the University of Vermont in 1982. There's also a short piece, Self Writing, um, which is in the um, uh, like collected uh, Foucault, and it also forms part of, um, I think it forms part of volume three of the history of sexuality, a six volume series that Foucault never completed. Now, Foucault talks about stoic technologies of the self. These are letter writing to friends, correspondence self-examination and he talks about the memory aids and then ascesis we'll come back to this but you remember that ascesis is exercise is a kind of spiritual exercise now for Foucault the art of living involves ascesis it involves training involves discipline think of Seneca wrestling think of Zeno uh, the acting or dancing Foucault talks about the need for abstinences Memorization, self examinations, meditation, silence, and listening to others. Other features are examining one's day, premeditating on future evils. The part of Seneca that is of real interest to Foucault is the Letters to Lucilius, which in the Penguin uh, volume is called Letters from the Stoic. Now, what Foucault is doing in, in these parts is something that I think is reminiscent of Frankl's concern, although Frankl is not mentioned by Foucault here, or I'm not really sure if he's mentioned anywhere in his work. Um, and that's about this transformation um, of ideas, of truths, of knowledge into ethical action. To not give up on one's dignity and one's meanings and to live those meanings out. Foucault says... That self-training is concerned with, quote, a transformation of truth into ethos. This comes up in different ways in these, in these pieces. In self-writing, he focuses a lot on the memory aids. Memory aids are kind of things that you recall about one's day, but also kind of quotations and stuff that you write down and memorize. They could also be like your own notes from reading that you then revisit these notes. But the other part is, is letters to friends. Not just, you know, writing about one's day, but examining one's day. They also involve supporting, um, consoling, and admonishing others. He also makes an interesting point, Foucault, that um, it's important not to just endlessly read one thing after the other without stopping to think about what we've read, to write notes on what we've read in order to kind of distill um, the content into useful lessons for our life. If we just endlessly go from one thing to another, we'll be in a state of stulti stultitia, so like stup stupidity, kind of absent-mindedness. We develop understanding by focusing our minds. And this is what ascesis is all about, this ethical program of exercise. And it's interesting to kind of think about what, how Foucault's understanding of ascesis, of exercise, differs from maybe our conventional view of being stoic, of having a stiff upper lip. That when we think about the Stoics exercise, and this might involve a renunciation of the passions, might involve a renunciation of love, of friends. These are charges that Martha Nussbaum is going to present in a moment. But for Foucault, Ascesis needn't involve that. It's not about the renunciation of oneself or, or other people. 
Instead, you know, I'm thinking of Camus, it involves living fully, it involves maximal concern with oneself and others. By being most useful, most aware, most engaged, it involves a deep recognition of our interdependence. Foucault says, quote, Ascesis means not renunciation, but a progressive consideration of self or mastery over oneself, obtained not through the renunciation of reality, but through the acquisition and assimilation of truth. It has as its final aim not preparation for enough reality, but access to the reality of this world. Again, it's like the, the wrestling, the training, being ready for adversity in different ways. In an interview that was published in 1984, The Ethics of the Concern for Self as a Practice of Freedom, I think it's called. He, this is a wonderful interview, it's quite long, and Foucault is really clear about his project. He talks about how philosophy and politics are, are deeply interlinked, that connection is fundamental. And he again talks about ascesis here. And ascesis is self-training, this self-knowledge, self-examination. As a way of becoming more ethically engaged. Foucault says, yes, for what is ethics if not the practice of freedom, the conscious practice of freedom? In the Technologies of the Self, the 1982 seminar, he also again makes this point about taking truths, taking meanings and putting them into practice as an ethos. This is what ascesis is about. He says, quote, Aleph, Alephea, truth, becomes ethos. It is a process of the intensification of subjectivity. Now, remember there was this kind of um, point about um, assimilation of a truth, but as well as its acquisition. To not just understand something, but to put it into practice. That's part of the acquiring process. So that means that we examine any truth to us. And the, and the truth becomes important when it when it serves a role in our art of living, in our way of life. Foucault encourages us to ask, quote, is this truth assimilated enough to become ethics so that we can behave as we must when an event presents itself? And this is why ethics and politics is therefore so important to philosophy. This might also help us appreciate why Stoic writers have a lot to say about politics. Cicero not directly as Stoic, but indirectly. Now, Martha Nussbaum, a wonderful writer, we uh, encountered her on, well, some of you on this course, we had a 12-week course on Martha Nussbaum. And on that course, we looked at one brilliant book by Nussbaum, which comes out in 1994, The Therapy of Desire. And this is a work that's focused on post-Hellenistic philosophy, or Hellenistic philosophy, post-Hellenistic Hellenistic philosophy. The stuff that basically comes after Aristotle. Epicurus, the skeptics and very prominently the Stoics. This is The Therapy of Desire. It's a great book on understanding the Stoics. Now Nussbaum focuses on the role of philosophy as a form of medicine and medicine analogies which um, she recognises as appearing prominently in, in Stoic writing. That the, the truths are part of our healing Part of there, there's something therapeutic about the meanings derived. Nussbaum also celebrates in this work the Stoics' high respect for each person's active practical reasoning, as she says. Now, one thing that she sees in Stoic ascesis exercise, the stuff that Foucault was just talking about in terms of medicine, is that this isn't just about healing the patient, it's about the patient understanding medical techniques so that the patient ultimately becomes the doctor, becomes the healer for understanding the structure of reality and its physics, understanding the nature of knowledge and its logic and understanding how to live in its ethics. What makes the Stoics very distinct, and this is true really of the Greek Stoic school of Zeno, Cleantes, Chrysippus and others, is its rigorous materialism. It's not that it, it accepts that there is some form of providence, but it's not particularly interested in the gods. It doesn't really have much to say about the gods. Muslim highlights also its quote radical criticism of conventional belief, 
Now, there's something else that Nussbaum also highlights with the Stoics, and that's their cosmopolitanism. Of course, cosmopolitanism, the idea that we're all citizens of the universe, something that Theresa May famously objected to, is something that emerges with Diogenes of Sinope, Diogenes the founder of the School of the Cynics. But we will know, we'll, we'll remember, that Zeno of Citium, the founder of the Stoics, was first taught by a cynic, by a Crates. And cosmopolitanism is a precept of the Stoics as well. Nussbaum describes this as the inclusion within philosophy of all rational humanity. And that is a wonderful project. Now what Nussbaum objects to um, is the Stoics' um, concern about the passions. They're striving for apatheia, to not be disturbed by negative emotions. Now Nussbaum reads this as being, not being disturbed by positive emotions too. She's worried about what she calls the extirpation of the passions. What, what's left behind in the teachings of Seneca or Marx or others? In her view, it's a very austere life. There's no love, no laughter, and no real attachment to others. Is this much for life? If we give up on these human attachments, even if they involve our vulnerability and our fragility? Most of think it's not. That they go too far in seeking the extirpation of the passions. Of course, this is a, this is a reading that we've kind of shared in um, and is vindicated, I suppose, by looking at Zeno um, as relayed in uh, Diogenes Laertius or looking at Cicero in the way that he summarizes Stoic thought. But what we've also seen in our Stoics is an emphasis on joy, on obligation. On a love that is able to bear immense grief and immense sufferings. Is that then the, the extirpation, the determination, the, the death the passion, of all passions? I'm not sure it is. Nussbaum, in any case, encourages, um, ends the therapy of desire by saying that we should uh, look, quote, with mercy at the ambivalent excellence and passion of a human life. And I would encourage us to do that with our Stoics too. Enough of work just to keep in mind as we start to round up is Pierre Hadot, um, who I, I, I suspect introduced Foucault to the importance of the Greek Stoics. Okay, right, let's start rounding up. So, where have we got to on this course? <laughs> We've covered a lot, haven't we? Um, <clears throat> well, I kind of gave you the bread and butter Stoics um, at the beginning, um, the uh, Greek and Roman Stoics. Nothing survives of the Greek Stoics, um, or only small quotations and bits and bobs. Um, so we looked at them indirectly through Diogenes Laertius. Um, we, looked, we met Zeno of Citium. Um, and then we, we spent more time on the Roman Stoics. We looked briefly at Musonius Rufus. One of the few writings of his that survives is uh, the opening of education to women. We looked at Epictetus. We looked at Marcus Aurelius and we looked at Seneca. We then went on a kind of on a different journey. I'll explain a bit more of this in a moment. We looked at the book of Ecclesiastes. We looked at the Dhammapada, attributed to the Buddha. We then looked at Michel de Montaigne, whose essays from early modern Europe we contrasted. We looked at Justus Lipsius at the same time. We looked at Spinoza, wonderful Spinoza. And then in the final weeks, we've been looking at Camus and the Absurd. The challenges to Stoic reasoning. We spent time with Viktor Frankl. And then in the final part, we thought about Foucault's idea about the care of the self, about ascesis, about um, freedom involving an ethics. You might want to think of Frankl, of freedom involving responsibility. And then we thought about with Nussbaum, about the unconventional nature of the Stoics, their appreciation of the emotions, but a caution about extinguishing the emotions too. Now, over this course, I've tried to kind of summarise general kind of processes that I see in a way of Stoic thinking that applies to thinkers who um, predate the Stoics um, or were not aware of them. The first precept was um, process, I should say, was self-knowledge. I've now changed that after reading Foucault to self-examination. 
because what we are focusing our attention on is something that is constantly changing you know as as is nature as is our relations with nature this idea of the self constantly being in process and in, and in flux is reminiscent in my view of the dhammapada we must examine this self that's what foucault's techniques are about but foucault is really giving a gloss of seneca compassion is enough for recognizing that other people are flawed like ourselves recognizing our own flaws recognizing that life is suffering seeing dignity and meaning in suffering wishing to alleviate the suffering of others wishing to teach and console others we've seen that in our stoics in lots of different ways maybe we don't really see that in the book of ecclesiastes but kohala the narrator still feels this kind of sadness at the suffering under the sun living with nature is enough very important for the greek stoics perhaps the, the original teaching living in accordance with nature, in accordance with how things are, commencing from the facts. In later parts, we began thinking about other problems for Stoic thinking. This came up with the book of Ecclesiastes, number four is transience. All things under the sun, all things of vanity, all things of breath. Suffering, Mara, as it's called in Adamapada, is everywhere. How do we escape suffering? Montaigne, the presence of death, losing one, one's own loved ones. There's also something that, that feeds into number five, which is our disposition to suffering. Do we engage in a state of relative apathy? Do we surrender? Do we become animals? This idea of the animal as being non-rational um, without feeling something that we also get from the Greek Stoics, and we saw it with Frankel too. We also see it in Spinoza. How do we respond? How do we amend our disposition? Because that is one thing that's up to us, for the Stoics. Our attitudes, our ideas, our judgments. The place of fate is enough for well, Frankl. I mean, he doesn't mention the Stoics in the, in Man's Search for Meaning. He would he would reject he well, he wholly rejects the submission to fate. That's what makes him very interesting. No amor fati here. Yeah. And then the final part, seven, one that you haven't seen yet, ethos. But the final part of Stoic thinking is this emphasis on living as an art of living and as, f and as philosophy being a way of life. And therefore, one can be considered a philosopher if they have something useful to contribute on how we live, how we live our lives. In, our, in the awareness of our relations and our dependence on others. Stoic thinking ultimately is an, is an ethos, one of its free fields and the other being logic and physics it guides us to live and live well and it guides us to live and seek a kind of contentment amid the worst sufferings amid things that are deeply uncertain and beyond our power it points us to a sense of equanimity it would be wrong to say that it calls for the destruction of the passions and it would be wrong to say that the stoics Got, um, think that serenity of mind is a state we can constantly exist in, far from it. But what their thinking is trying to guide us to is a recognition of what nature is and what we are as natural beings, as passionate human animals. And to recognise within that nature too, moments of love, moments of beauty, and opportunities for courage. Here, the image of Van Gogh. Um, it's reminiscent to the, one of the analogies that the Greek Stoics use of the relations of ethics, logic and physics, you know, being like the wall that surrounds a field and the earth. And then the fruit, the, the crops that grow in the soil, this is the ethics, the way of life that follows, ensues, is expressed by this adequate understanding of nature. What it also involves, and what the Stoics kind of guide us to, is this ability to kind of find an inner citadel, as Marcus calls it, a retreat. Epictetus describes it like a garrison. Of course, that can be something that we might be wary of. Sigmund Freud in Civilization and its Discontents describes the moralizing and harsh superego, our source of moral judgments, um, as like a garrison in a conquered town. Maybe there is something about what the Stoics have to say, which is like, you know, it's, it's self-admonishing nature. And we saw this most in Epictetus. You know, it can feel hostile. It can be frustrating. It isn't always easy reading. 
but it's important. Montaigne talks about talks about the need for a back room, a place of quietness. Frankl talks about the need for solitude, the importance of solitude as a way of kind of thinking, the space of thinking. In all of these spaces, in all of these places off the mind, are the opportunity to reflect and to apply our minds to understand things and understand ourselves in the process. What it, the Stoic kind of processes ultimately amount up to is the active striving of the mind to understand. And I think this is neatly encapsulated in a remark of Spinoza. It's a wonderful line from Spinoza. It's actually a, a simplified quote. The endeavour to understand is the first and only basis of virtue. This is, it is, I mean, you'll see if you, this is a quote that is sometimes associated with Spinoza. It's a mod, it's a slightly modified quotation, but it's part of the, um, the Spinoza reading that we looked at, part of Ethics Part 4, Proposition 26 Demonstration. And I think there is so much that we can profit from and gain by thinking about this. Here it is on a baby, on my son. Uh, this is when he was about uh, two months old, Yasha. Uh, my partner, Vera, surprised me one morning by having this T-shirt made up. And it, it blew me away. When we think about the different sources of meaning in our lives, they're always going to differ, aren't they? Different forms of love and care and so on. It's also interesting to think too about the different journeys that we all take. And the journey of a, of a small child is now age two. And you've heard him in the background of a lot of our recordings. What his kind of journey and his road into understanding will be. His meaning might be different from mine. But he will need to find and establish that meaning. And in that sense, I think there's a lot from the Stoics that could be useful to him as there is to all of us. This recognition that we are just small parts of a much wider whole of nature. And as Marcus says, and a response from that, not of pessimism, not, to, not a sense of suicide, the absurd that we got in Camus, but a sense of wonder and revelation that this is how nature is. And nature is utterly magnificent and nature is cruel. And things often feel meaningless and terrible things happen. And we experience the worst sadnesses, but we also experience immense loves, joys and beauty. And life is like a water horrible storm and involving all of these elements swirling around at different times. The question for the Stoics is how we orient ourselves in those stormy seas. And that ultimately, I think, is, is, is the gain from studying their teachings. Okay, so when we meet on Monday, this is what we're going to discuss. What kind of text is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? Why do human beings need meaning? Why do we need meaning? What is this will to meaning? We're going to drill into that argument. Then, in the final part, I want us to reflect on the course. Is there a particular thinker or thinkers um, that have been really nourishing or interesting to you? What do you think is the lasting contribution of the Stoics to your own art of living, your own way of thinking, the way you wish or will or have lived your life? Uh, the room on Zoom will open at 12.45, slightly later than usual, but we can have a talk and uh, we can um, raise a glass of wine or something um, after three o'clock. Okay, um, yeah, I feel very sad to end. end. <laughs> I just want to thank you. Um, this has been a great class uh, for me. Um, I basically, how did the second half of this course fit together? Ecclesiastes, the Dhammapada, Spinoza, Montaigne, um, Camus. Nietzsche, Kafka, Dostoevsky, what was the link? Well, the link to me, apart from that, I see a kind of stoic process of what processes at work in them, is that these thinkers are, have all been very, very, very important to me at different times in my life. And that's why I, I wanted as my kind of final course at Mary Ward uh, to kind of explore with you writers and thinkers that I've, I, I found most interesting, most stimulating, most difficult. So it's been an immense kind of, I found it very personally rewarding. The stuff that we've covered and, and the discussions that we've had, even when we've disagreed or found things that we um, objected to in our thinkers. Some of you in this class have been teaching for about four years. You know, we began um, 
September 2016, looking at Kant, and we've done many things since. Hegel, Spinoza, Hannah Arendt, we did that class on political philosophy, we did that class on the Anthropocene, we did a class on Martha Nussbaum. Some of you have taught on the uh, Introduction to Philosophy class as well. Some of you have taught on the Intermediate Philosophy class. We've done a lot of work together. Um, and yeah, I hope we keep in touch. This is my email address. I've got a blog where I'll post stuff I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I've got to end it somewhere. So thank you very much.